Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 21st meeting in this year of the Rural Affairs Climate Change and Environment Committee. I hope everyone's enjoyed a good summer break. Um, before we go ahead, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch off their mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. Um, and you may notice some committee members consulting tablets during the meeting. This is because we provide meeting papers in digital format, and I guess that some witnesses may be wired for sound as well. Um, I have apologies from Alec Ferguson, and I welcome his substitute, Jamie McGregor, uh, to the meeting this morning. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. This first item is about um, item four, which is a consideration of the committee's letter to the Scottish Government on petition PE 01490-0 on control of uh, wild goose numbers. Are we agreed? Yeah. Thank you very much. Item, agenda item two is subordinate legislation. This item today is for the committee to consider the following negative instrument, the Seed Fees Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-167. Members uh, should note that no motion to annul has been received in relation to the instrument, and I refer members to the paper. Are there any comments? Jim Hume? Just a small point, mm -hmm. on, on consultation at the bottom of page three. A, a note that the government did consult with uh, around 150 plus interested parties, but only one response. So um, well, that's obvious, which was from NFU Scotland, I believe. So that's obviously quite concerning if. Um, Stakeholders aren't engaging fully with issues that can obviously affect them quite, quite well, dramatically. Uh, we note that. <coughs> and uh, are there any other comments that members wish to make? If so, uh, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? We agreed. We are agreed. Thank you. Agenda item three is Scottish Government's Agriculture Holdings Legislation Review Group Interim Report. <clears throat> Third item today is for the committee to take evidence from stakeholders on the interim report produced by Scottish Government's Agricultural Holdings Legislation Review Group ahead of hearing uh, from the Cabinet Secretary and the review group members on the 20th of August. And I very much welcome this morning uh, Mike Gascoigne, Convener of the Rural Affairs Subcommittee of the Law Society of Scotland. Morning. Uh, Nigel Miller, President of the NFUS. Morning. David Johnson, Chair of uh, SLE. Morning. Uh, Christopher Nicholson, Chair of the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association. Morning, Christopher. Um, Martin Hall, uh, the Scottish Agriculture Arbiters and Valuers, SAVA, um, representing uh, Tenant Farming Forum and former SAVA President. Morning. Uh, and Andrew Wood, FRICS, from, uh, from RICS. Good morning to you. Uh, there's no opening statement, so we're going to move straight to questions and answers. Um, once all the questions are finished, uh, we'll see if there's any final points that stakeholders wish to make at that stage that we haven't covered. So, you know, we're looking at uh, the review on agricultural holdings with a view to having a vision for the tenant farming sector. And uh, we need to discuss probably um, how that vision can be delivered, uh, which the government says is a dynamic sector that gets the best from the land and the people farming it provides opportunities for new entrants and forms part of a sustainable future for Scottish farming as a whole. What approach do you think um, is going to be necessary to achieve a vision like that without looking at any of the details that are bound to come up and uh, questions that follow? But generally, your vision. Anyone like to kick off? Yes, Martin Hall. That's all right. Do, do I press the button? There. No, you don't. Um, I'll start off by saying, really, you know, if, if, the, if this is going to work, we need to find a system that operates on a business footing. It's, this is about farming businesses, really. Um, so that's primary. It's about people, but, and it's about mutual respect. And if we can get those three elements into the system, then we'll be a long way there. Okay. Um, we clearly need an alternative paradigm than we have today. 
Um, but, uh, you know, we'll look at that in some details. Anyone else like to comment on the, the vision at the moment? Uh, Christopher. Um, as to, as to, from STFA, we're um, very supportive of the vision of the, um, of the review group as to what the future tentative sector should look like. Um, we support their, their approach, their evidence gathering, and, and um, support many of the, in fact, all of the solutions that they are, appear to be um, considering at the moment. Um, one aspect we, we notice that the, the, their remit is to purely look at um, tenancies from the perspective of the tenanted sector and um, the business model of tenancies. But um, to our mind, tenants, tenants have a, a much greater role than purely just the operation, operation of their businesses and um, the Land Reform Review Group have made some recommendations um, as to the public interest argument for preserving um, the viability of tenanted farming families. Um, and we feel that to have a, 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 a proper and effective review of ag holdings, you have to take on board some of the um, land reform considerations. And this con our country has a history of addressing tenancy problems by um, addressing tenancy legislation, so going in at the bottom and addressing the problem from the bottom up, whereas other countries have addressed the problem by looking at the, um, the open market for land and controls and regulations on the, on the ownership and buying and selling of land and have, a, have put a balance into the system by having controls on, on la land reform and, and land reform issues rather than looking at the t tenancy legislation and where you have a balance in the land ownership, the tenancy sectors appear to work without as much regulation as ours. So the, the evidence suggests that to come to a successful answer with regard to the operation of tenancies, you need to look at both the tenanted sector and the, the, the land issue in terms of land ownership and regulation on the land market. Are you saying that uh, uh, the business and working and the respect issues are all very well, but um, perhaps what the Land Reform Review Group is talking about uh, would actually deal with aspects of the buying and selling of land as a whole. So therefore, that should not be ignored yeah, in the, the outcomes of uh, this, this group's deliberations. I, I, I think it's a unique opportunity now that we have um, land reform and tenancy reform as two parallel work streams for the two to link up and, and, and there is er, er, are areas of overlap. I don't disagree with anything the review group have come up with in terms of it's, it's very important that business models work for tenancies, but there are other considerations that come into play. And for a, if we're looking at the viability of tenancies in the long term and the future of tenant farming families and their wider role in fragile rural communities, um, there are the, the, what appears to be a narrow definition in the remit of of the Ag Holdings Review Group may be a limiting factor. However, I do feel that they are taking on board some of the issues that the Land Reform Review Group came up with. Well, we we'll, may explore some of that a little later. Anyone else want to comment on the vision? Yes, Nigel? Yeah, I think just very briefly, uh, um, certainly we are supportive of what the Review Group have done. And I think uh, I've been hugely encouraged by you know, the way they've gone about it, uh, uh, the sort of care they've taken in consulting. And I think their overall vision is, is pretty much you know, where we'd like it to be. So it's, uh, it's probably quite an exciting sort of time to actually see that happen. And, and we genuinely believe we're going to get something good out of this. Uh, I think that, yeah, I, I think that the, the, the Chris is in some ways you know, in the same place as we are. I don't think that, you know, regulating the sector is, is the only answer. Uh, and certainly, the, uh, you know, I think that the tax environment we work in, I think, is pretty important. The subsidy work, uh, environment we work in is pretty important. Uh, and I think that the, the sort of uh, uh, the higher level of, uh, uh, um, uh, I suppose, infrastructure that we use, you know, whether it be the land court or arbitration or some other body, is going to be absolutely critical in, in actually uh, uh, balancing the sort of inevitable issues uh, that, that, that do occur in a minority of cases. 
The other thing that's a real danger is that we focus very much on uh, you know, the 91 tenancies and we forget or we don't put enough effort into the future. And I think the review group are very alive to that. But the reality is that uh, you know, vehicles like share farming, uh, you know, vehicles like uh, 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 you know, some sort of uh, uh, you know, long-term LDT or, or LDT to uh, uh, retirement, or, or you know, which allows a tenant to actually renovate a, a, a run-down uh, property and get some value back for that, for all that work. Now, I know that that flexibility is there, but we need to actually uh, uh, you know, define that in a model which people have confidence in, so that both the landowner and a tenant can actually you know, have a lifetime or, or, or a, a, a significant period to actually invest in that. And that must be to the benefit of everybody and the rural community. Uh, so I think some of it is actually working into the, the structures we have and creating models which are attractive for people. Thanks. Anyone else at this yeah. stage? David? Yeah, and, um, I think I broadly, uh, broadly endorse what Nigel is, is putting forward. Uh, SLE, we very much welcome the review. We think the review has been carried out um, in a very inclusive, a very progressive way. Uh, and is genuinely looking to find the solutions to the, to the problems that are, that are being identified. Um, for us, the tenancy sector is of, is of vital importance, not just to maintain what is there, but to grow it. Um, we've got to have changes to CAP coming through in the next five years, and after that it's going to be a diminishing subsidy. So we're going to need ever-increasing flexibility uh, within farming for farming businesses to be able to diversify, restructure, grow, uh, and adapt to the changes we're going to have coming forward. Um, they're difficult to quantify those, but here's a unique opportunity um, to provide that, but also at the same time to um, reinstill confidence in both the tenants and the landowners that um, what we have is something that's fit for the 21st century and will drive us forward for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years plus. Um, it's very important that um, the balance is struck so that um, the pendulum is not favouring one side or the other, and we've been very heartened by the way the review group has gone about addressing that and um, taking on board. And we're looking forward to, to, to working with them into the future. Hey, um, we will have a lot more. Yes, indeed, Andrew. Briefly. Um, just reinforcing some of the points that have been made before. Uh, the RSS have been working with all the others here closely with the review group. And um, there's been a number of specific things that have come out uh, as part of that process that I think uh, are extremely valuable. Um, we've been through a process of a number of years where, uh, with the Tenant Farming Forum, looking at all sorts of issues. But one of the key things that we've lacked is the data to back up uh, the issues that have been discussed. And in particular, uh, there's been a number of, you know, concerns that have been raised, but we've never really had the facts to, 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 to look into those in any detail. And one of the important things I think that will come out of the review group's uh, data collection is, 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 the, is the facts to, to look at these things in more detail. Um, there are clearly uh, some conflicting issues in terms of uh, where the review group are going and where uh, the land reform uh, agenda is going. Um, because what we're after, I think everybody is after, is this vibrant tenanted sector. And that needs the confidence of people to invest in, in buying land to let. And, and we just have to look at that very carefully because I think there is a, a conflicting issue there. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's uh, move into some of the detail of uh, the aspirations of the review group. Jim Hume's going to kick off. Thank you, convener. Um, there are eight aspirations that the, that the review group have come up with, so it would be interesting to hear from the stakeholders uh, whether they agree with these aspirations and, uh, and how achievable they think they are. Uh, I will have to go over them, obviously, just to remind you. I'm sure you've maybe memorised them already, but such things as a, a range of flexible ten tenancy options to, to suit the different uh, circumstances, uh, an ability for people to move in, out, through, and... Uh, the tenanted sector as their businesses develop, um, that business investment in the tenant sector uh, would be equivalent to uh, that in the owner-occupied sector. Uh, barriers to entries uh, can be a a addressed, such as uh, especially for those regarding new entrants, uh, so that people can farm successfully. Uh, rent levels would reflect commercial returns from a well-managed farm business. 
that the supply of tenanted land would be broadly compatible with the demand at the rent levels, uh, that risk would be uh, sh shared more between tenants and owners uh, to encourage innovation, etc. And uh, finally, that the underlying culture will be looking forward and based on a uh, shared endeavour, mutual respect. And I think uh, trust would maybe be something that, uh, uh, as Martin's mentioned already. So that's the, the eight there. Um, do you want to ask any specific one at the moment? Or? Well, I, I, th I think... Um, I think one would be rent levels, which has been one that's maybe been more uh, okay. topical at the moment, so we could start off with rent levels, but uh, feel free to pick any of those. From, from SLE's point of view, they're all um, spot on. They're all, they're all achievable, um, and they're exactly what is required to uh, generate the confidence to bring more people into, into the market, letting land bring more people to, to, to rent land. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about the, the, the rent measures in there. Rents have got to be um, fair and sustainable for both sides. You can't have a rent that's going to be too much uh, for the productive holding of the capacity to, to produce, otherwise it's unsustainable. Um, and at the same time, you've got to have uh, a realistic <coughs> and fair rent that landlords receiving to encourage them to let. Uh, and part of the review process is going to be looking at Section 13 uh, and how it will... Um, be amended, altered, new ideas to, to maintain that level of um, negotiation between the parties. Um, I mean, we sat down, as you're probably all aware, STFA, NFUS, and then SLE, and come up with this um, interim measure to uh, look at uh, rent levels with CPI uh, as, as a guideline to give a sense check where we are. And um, we find that progressive. We find that um, hopefully will helpful for the industry and allow... Um, some calmness to return to where we are now and give a chance to the review to group to have a good look at the, the mechanism involved in, in, in assessing rents going forward. Okay. Yep. Um, we, we, we obviously, we, we have made progress in the last few weeks um, with the help of uh, Andrew Thin as, to come up with an interim measure before any le recommended legislation from this review process can be implemented. So that's um, quite a leap forward. Um, we see the, 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 the real problem with the rent test as the primacy given to the open market test, um, which adds complexity and uncertainty. There's no clear, transparent way of making the adjustments and, and disregards that, that are required. And we feel that any rent test that incorporates the open market test as a formal um, part of the test is going to be lengthy and confrontational um, and, and it's recognised that it may not result in viable long-term rents. So our preference is um, in accordance with the vision of the, of the review group that, that rents should reflect um, the agricultural earnings capacity of the holding and that would um, ensure that rents remain viable. The other um, area of conflict with rents is um, ascertaining <laughs> what improvements have been provided by the tenant and what improvements have been provided by the landlord. And there's a huge difference in that provision um, between different tenancies. Um, that the, the, the underlying principle of rents, agricultural rents, is that the, the, the landlord receives rent only for what he has provided. And, and that is a core principle that, that we must um, uh, not lose sight of. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nigel's. Uh, Nigel. Yeah. Um, probably this is quite uh, uh, your uh, comprehensive list, and I think that you all of us would you know, aspire to them all, uh, and I think you know, a lot of them are deliverable. I suspect the supply and demand one is a particularly difficult. Yeah. Uh, and, and the reality, you know, the, the thought that we're going to actually, you know, suddenly you know, change to a world where there are. You know, a lot of opportunities for tented land, I think, is, 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 is it's not going to happen fast. And I, 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 
you know, given the uh, expansionary nature of uh, farm businesses and their economic pressures on them, it's going to be a difficult one to, to actually drive. Mm -hmm. I suspect that if we're really serious about that, then you, you, we're going to have to look more at you know, share farming, which I've talked about before, and, and use that as a way in. Uh, and I think we've also got to look at you know, some of these larger uh, farm businesses that you know, now you know, focus maybe totally on the arable sector within their portfolio, their assets there, which actually could be spun off as a, as a subsidiary business or a tenanted business, uh, either a livestock, pigs, dairy, with some of the steading infrastructure they have and using some of their byproducts. And we've got to be a lot smarter. We've got to create these new opportunities rather than than uh, doing what we did before. We've got to actually look at ways of, of a more diverse use of the rural economy. Uh, and I think we've also got to be you know, a bit more imaginary. I think government's got a real role in this about how we use Pillar 2. The reality is we're all hooked into new entrants. The new entrant package we've got looks pretty good, uh, or I think, it's, or I think it, it, it potentially is very good, but we're going to restrict it to a very small number of individuals who are just entering the industry. And a lot of those individuals will not be able to take up those opportunities because they don't have the, the matching uh, funding to do it. Uh, we've got to actually look at second stage uh, developers, you know, going from uh, a very temporary holding onto their next holding, which might be a, you know, a, 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 an LDT or, or, or something like that. We need to support them then. And there's nothing in, in what we've, we've uh, introduced in, in Pillar 2 just now that does that. Now, if we're serious about you know, people really getting established in the business, uh, in the industry, and getting a flow through, then it's gotta be, there's, you know, there's got to be intervention at various stages to open that up, as well as uh, vehicles that they can use. Uh, on the rent determination, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm you know, greatly heartened by what's been achieved in the last uh, you know, you know, few days, uh, and appreciate the effort everybody else has, else has put into it. The reality is that it's, it's a, I suppose, a quick fix for a, a, your particular gap that we're, we're facing before the review uh, actually uh, uh, moves rent determination on maybe to a, a different stage. But the, the principle is actually quite attractive. Uh, what I would say is that uh, you know, the CPI looks as if it's a, a reasonable baseline. In reality, uh, I suspect that there may be better ways of, if, if you were, or more sophisticated ways of looking at uh, the profitability of our industry uh, without, you know, with, uh, uh, without actually going to the CPI. I'm not sure it is necessarily the, the right index, but the, the, the principle is, 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 is quite a clever one. But it is a sense test, and I think, or, or, or a, mm. a, a, a viability test uh, to make sure that we don't stray out of uh, a, a, a reasonable area for rent determination. Uh, the, the key role of how you determine rents, I think, is still, still uh, a, a, a problematic issue. And I think that's something we'll probably come back to in this evidence session. Um, I th we've got a couple. Do you have another question? Yeah, I, I was going to come in, uh, unless somebody was still... Uh, I thought somebody was wanting to come in. Because there's two other people. members of the committee want to yes, ask and, oh, subsequent the, ones. Yeah, no, uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Then I'll come back again. Uh, just on risk sharing and, and really investment sharing, the, the, the two similar things. And... In the past, there have been different sort of um, partnership uh, agreements that have perhaps done that. Have, the, have those been successful, and what sort of uh, instruments could we use in the future to increase the, the risk sharing and therefore uh, in better investment in um, tenancies? Um, the, the, the key um, mechanism that's used for risk sharing out with traditional tenancies at the moment is, is contract farming um, or, or partnership farming that, that can be structured in different ways um, because in those you're effectively looking at a, 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 a commercial deal between two individuals so they, the, the rent and the, and the uh, terms of that reflect the investment and in most of those instances the, 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 the rent isn't a fixed amount of money and, and both sides are sharing in the, in the end result um, from year to year. So you would have the profit of the farm and the, uh, the, 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 the farmer who's doing the bulk of the work would get paid for his day-to-day -day operations and, and then when the, the, the profit is divided at the end of the year according to a formula that would have been agreed at the outset. So those, those types of processes exist. I think where the, um, the, the review group are coming from is, is really looking at um, is, is investment in fixed equipment. And uh, 
there are, there are some specific issues about that. Um, there's some history um, with all agricultural holdings issues where uh, some of the arrangements that were made to do with fixed equipment weren't uh, possibly equitable or, or appropriate. Um, but the, the, the key thing from the tenanted sector is that they, they get a return on that investment. And, and generally, they wouldn't you know, go and build a new grain store or cattle court if there wasn't going to be a return against it. But equally, when they come to the end of the tenancy, that there is some reflection and, 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 and uh, compensation for that investment, because there's still value in it that would be passed on to somebody else. Um, the issue from a landlord's point of view, in terms of encouraging investment, if you're going to put up a cattle court that costs £100,000, say, um, you need to make sure that the rent is going to reflect that investment and that you're going to get some return yourself um, against the money you're putting into the farm. And therefore, you know, that's where the, the, the investment and, and the rent review process gets um, fairly intertwined uh, mm -hmm. because you have to be, make sure that, you know, to encourage that investment, that the, the rent review process is going to really fairly take into account the, the, the money going into the, the capital funds going into the holding. Thank you. Okay. Um, Dave Thompson, then Nigel Don with questions. But uh, yeah. just focus in on the um, the, the the rent uh, reviews, the rent situation. Now, it's my understanding that the market test was done away with in England in 1984. Um, that gentleman's uh, shaking his head there, Andrew Wood. Uh, <coughs> that's what I have in my notes here. You can maybe correct me on that. If that's not the case, um, then we can't say that there will be some evidence as to the effect of that over time. But what I would like to know is why um, the market test then is seen as a preferable method of fixing rent rather than looking at the earnings capacity of uh, the holding. Uh, obviously, this is a very complex thing. and. We'll probably pick up on things like assignation and all the rest of it uh, later on, but they, they all do sort of link in together. Um, because the point that, that Andrew Wood just made about a landlord investing £100,000 wants to get the return on the rent, if, for instance, and I'm straying into a point I want to pick up in more detail later, um, 91 tenancies uh, were assignable, that would deal with the problem because the tenant themselves would be able to raise the cash, which they can't do at the moment, to build that, that, um, that barn or whatever. And the uh, value of the farm, the productivity of the farm would increase. And if you had a method of uh, assessing rent based on what was being produced, um, the earnings capacity then that would take care of all of that. So I, I just wonder if um, the members of the panel would explain to me why they feel that the current market test is a, the best way to do it and why a test based on earnings capacity isn't, if that's their view. Um, I mean, as far as I'm aware, I, I'm not a legal expert in this in, in any shape or form, but um, in the English model does have an open market element within it, but it also has a uh, link to the productive capacity of the holding, and it gives equal weighting to both measures as a way of uh, providing, if you like, a check and balance as to how do you assess the rent. Uh, and I think there is a, a strong argument for bringing in that um, measure into the legislation in Scotland, <coughs> along with the open market, to have different ways of doing it. Uh, and provide, a, if you like, a sense check. I mean, in reality, um, when you're doing the rent reviews, more often than not, you do that sort of um, productive capability of the holdings anyway, it's just, just to do the sense check. It's an unofficial way of doing it. Like my understanding at the moment is the legislation doesn't allow for that if you end up in the land court. It's not deemed to be relevant. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, for us, perfectly sensible to start to bring that in. Um, we would be reluctant to see the open market uh, done away with because it provides um, another measure of seeing where the rents are, are fair and reasonable. Uh, I think you know, certainly, you know, our members or certainly our tent members are, 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 I think, very determined that we, 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 
you know, prioritise or get better balance in, in rent determination as far as uh, an economic uh, test goes or, or, or the capability of the actual holding. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, how you balance that with uh, uh, you know, an open market uh, 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 evidence you know, is, is, is the crucial factor. Uh, you know, I think that the attraction of the English model, uh, I suppose, is that it's tried and tested and it's been through the court. And therefore, I think all organisations, that you know, STFA and ourselves and SLE, have looked at that as something which might you know, break us out of the, 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 the threat of uh, court action and, and give us a model to work on. You know, I don't think it's perfect. You know, that's the reality. And I think if you look at uh, rentals, certainly in some parts of England, they're actually quite high. Uh, and uh, they're also, uh, um, you know, I suppose, driven by quite volatile markets. And so I think that... Uh, um, you know, th th there are issues about how we actually you know, use budgets or we use uh, 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 the earnings capacity of a holding to, to drive, to drive a, a, a rental process. Uh, and certainly, I think there would have to be a defined uh, budgetary process and there would have to be an averaging of, uh, uh, of costs and, and outputs to actually ensure that we, we take these spikes out. But I think the principle's right. I don't think it's the, the whole answer. I suspect that after that, you've got to go to some sort of sense test or, or uh, as well, because uh, the other thing which I think is you know, an issue, you know, probably, and certainly in some parts of Scotland, is that we have rents which are probably out of kilter with other regions. That's the reality. And maybe they should be out of kilter. There actually will be regional differences. But I think that there's also some rents which have been... Uh, uh, your review process has been neglected. And if we try and move those uh, to come in line with the market, we create a, 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 an unacceptable pressure on that business. So we've actually got to look at, if we're going to adjust towards a, a new rental review system, uh, or a, 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 we've actually got to have a phased process over you know, six, seven, eight years to allow people to adapt to that. To that. You know, once people have confidence in the system, let's have a phasing process when we get there. And then hopefully then it's more uh, like an index that you're, you're rolling on every three years. Uh, now, that's, that's a, uh, uh, you know, a tall order to deliver that. But I think all those are components. We need confidence in the system, you know, and, and to get that, we need a, a budgetary system which is, is robust and, and takes spikes out. We need some sort of balance in it, probably with the market. Go to a sense test, and if there are uh, big deviations from the norm, we need to have a phased uh, change, changeover to the, to the new system. Martin, and then Christopher. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think the... Um, most practitioners in the, in the real world, when we're out there negotiating rents, either for landlords or tenants, would, would undertake um, bo you know, say both methods. We'd look at the market and we'd also look at the viability as well. Uh, the courts uh, in the last sort of two decisions have, have moved away from that and, 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 and directed us towards using markets as the, as the primacy. But um, most landlords or tenants want a sustainable rent. You know, they, they recognise that, and, and it's, I think it's quite important to bring that balance back. Um, I, I agree that south of the border, the um, practice is, is looking at the market and the budget in equal measure uh, and, and having, giving, giving them equal weighting. Um, the slight... Um, you know, I was involved in the, in the publication of the, of the Practitioner's Guide last year, and I've just put a slight word of caution in, in that um, budgets can introduce... Um, depending on which time you take, can, can introduce a, a large degree of, of um, variance, and, and, and that's really down to the volatility of, of commodities. And so looking at the Moonsey case we did um, when, that, when we were writing this, over a six-year six period, the, the variance on that rent could be anything from 8,000 rent up to 84,000, depending on which moment in time you, you looked at that rent. So... There's a balanced approach, I would agree with Nigel, um, but just be, you need to be aware that there's, there's you know, big variances out there if you look purely at the budget approach. OK. Uh, Christopher Nicholson and then Andrew Wood um, in this section, then we'll move on to another question. The, the, the English now have almost 30 years' experience of their rent test, and I accept what Martin is saying, that there, if you go purely on budgets, there can be an element of volatility but the other part of the English rent test, which is a comparison, the formal part of the test, which is comparison with sitting tenant, agreed sitting tenants' rents, um, allows some of that volatility to be ironed out. But one of the benefits of the overall outcome of the English test is that during periods of agricultural downturn that we saw post-1997, rents went down, whereas in Scotland, rents 
didn't go down. Um, so the English test has been shown to follow the fortunes of farming um, better. And going back to volatility, um, historic um, statistics like farm business income are volatile, but rents are set looking forward, and there isn't as much volatility in the forward prices. So, for example, the forward price a week, two, three years in advance, in recent years has always been around about the 140, 150 mark pounds a ton, but as soon as you get close to harvest, you get the, the, the volatility. So if you look forward and use sitting tenant comparables, you can iron out that, that volatility. But the, one of the issues with using sitting tenant comparables of, on agreed rents is that everybody needs equal access to that information. And um, it would be hugely helpful if Scotland had a, had a, a database of, um, of rents and details of, of holdings to allow that process to happen clearly at, at rent review time. Yeah, and uh, unless Mike Gascoigne wanted to come in on this point, um, I'll have Andrew Wood. I'm happy to pass here. Uh, yeah. If I could say, uh, could be, uh, um, my, the stakeholder I represent um, has as its policy that it does, should not um, make known its feelings about government proposals or government policy. That is for government. What we are in the business of doing is organising, hopefully, and engendering good law. And until there is a bill in front of us, we are rather on the sideline, but I'm happy to try and add to the debate as we go along. That's OK. I just thought I would just ask anyway. But Andrew Wood? Very briefly. <clears throat> um, the, we already have a, a very complex process, um, and, and uh, informally people do look at uh, budgets and productivity uh, you know, throughout the industry one has to be very careful of introducing that and how that's structured in a formal way because of some of the points that have been made before because various people will buy their fertilizer at different times of year sell their crop at different times of year so huge volatility in terms of you know agreeing how uh, that uh, process should be looked at and and the english system is not without its faults um, my firm worked throughout England and so we've got first-hand experience of the difficulties people have in agreeing the budgetary side of it. Um, so we do need to look at that quite carefully because it isn't, it isn't a panacea. Um, the second thing that we just need to be slightly careful about, um, the, the, when you come to relet a farm, um, you are going to be in the hands of the market. You're going to be tendering it on an open market basis, and people will put their rents in on that basis. If we introduce a system that at the first rent review results in a completely different test in terms of how the rent is judged, we could create a system that is a further barrier to letting of land. And so we just have to be slightly careful about that in terms of you know, what happens after a farm is let from the first time when it is going to be an open market test because it'll be tendered in the market. Uh, and people will, as the very nature of it, be competing to, to get that land. Um, you know, when the first review comes along, what happens then if you're moving away from the market test? Thank you. Um, Nigel Tone. Can I come in? Nice, actually. Can you yeah, second? certainly. Jamie McGregor. Uh, is this for my question, or, or is this for the supplementary. supplementary? Yes, just on the question of David Thompson's question, um, with great respect, um, he talked about earnings capacity being a, a, a measure which could be used. Um, I think this would be very difficult um, because obviously earnings capacity on any um, unit would depend on how efficiently that's run and the individuals who run it. Uh, and, and also, um, you know, how, how, how much they put into the land. So how, I don't know how you would, you know, how on earth you would measure earnings capacity uh, between farms. That, that, that would really be my, the point I'm making. Um, yes, all, all farmers farm to different standards and abilities, but in the context of a rent test, you're not considering the individual farmer, you're considering the hypothetical farmer, um, who is, in essence, your, your Mr. Average from the SAC Farm Business Handbook. And there's plenty of... Um, statistics, whether it's from John Nix, the government, or the SAC handbook that can tell you what um, um, a hypothetical farmer should be making from that particular type of farm in that area on that land. 
So you're not, you're not considering when the individual farmer's bought his fertiliser, you're considering what the hypothetical farmer would do in that situation. And I think with the, with the statistical information we have from research and government, um, that's easily achievable. Okay, okay. David uh, Johnson. Um, I, I, I brought something to what Chris is, is saying there. Um, however, there is, a, there is a risk that um, by using that method when you go into the farm, effectively what you're doing is assessing uh, the way that that person is farming that farm and having a critique of it. And that could run the risk of creating um, a degree of tension between landlord and tenant if landlord says you're, you're farming in a way that I think should be done differently. The tenant says, no, this is fine. So it's not the, the panacea. There are problems within there. But I think it's method that needs to be looked at. OK, we, we're trying to um, keep this tight. But um, Nigel Miller and then Dave Thompson wants to come back with a supplementary on this point, And I want to come in after Sorry. that. Sorry. With, with, with time very short, really just to agree Sorry. with Chris that uh, uh, you're, you're using these stats like SAC and NICS, you, you can actually you know, do budgets. You've got to average them as well. It is, it is, you know, it's not perfect. There will be issues about it, but it, it's, it's certainly something we should be thinking and, and, and looking at. Yeah. Dave Thompson. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Just very briefly, it was just something Andrew uh, Wood said when he was uh, answering there. I just wonder, uh, when, when he was talking about the the first rent review, you know, compared to the, the rent that was dealt with when the purchase was made. I mean, what's the evidence from England that that, that is a problem? Because they've had 30 years of the sort of system we're talking about. So it should be pretty clear as to whether the first rent review does create a different figure. Um, it, they, it can do. Um, but remember, in England, they, they still do take account of the market as part of the test. So. Um, it, it, you know, you're not moving purely to a budgetary system. Um, you know, the budget and, and the market are looked at in balance. So, it, you know, it would even out sort of peaks and troughs. Um, clearly, if you had a very high rent tendered and then you had a period of catastrophic prices, uh, then there is potential for quite a large downward rent review at the first review. But, you know, that, that is a, that's an unusual set of circumstances. Yeah, so, the, so the mixed um, aspect of the English system is what gives a wee bit more balance. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just, Just for to <laughs> clarify, the, the English system, the, the earnings capacity part of the test only applies to secure tenancies, the mm -hmm. 90, 1986 Act tenancies. And the, the new types of tenancies have... Um, the, the rent test is essentially freedom of contract, open market, and, and it seems that we're in this cut north of the border going down a similar system, looking at freeing up the new style tenancies, um, but making adjustments to um, improve the resilience of the old style tenancies. Okay, okay um, I'd like to come at this a slightly different way. You know, the supply of tenanted land will be broadly compatible with the demand at uh, particular rent levels. Um, and I'd like to relate this to the 223% um, increase in the cost of buying farmland in the last 10 years, as reported by Knight Frank, uh, quoted in the Press and Journal on the 30th of June, um, a figure which confirms you know, the, the ongoing situation there. Uh, I'm wondering if that uh, saleable value of land on the market has a huge impact on the ability of landlords and tenants to reach mutually agreed approaches. I'd like to explore this, uh, approaches to rent levels and so on. So is the saleable land uh, you know, a price which is, seems to me to be completely separate from the economic value of that land, uh, something which is dogging the process of making rents at a level that is actually going to meet the economic circumstances. Martin Hall. If I could come in there, I, mean, I feel quite strongly, because I've seen it reported in the press, that, that there is some relationship between rents and capital values, and, and that certainly is not the case. You know, the, the, the market, the land market, if it's you know, arable land, 7,000 an acre, that bear, as you're absolutely correct in what you say, it bears no resemblance to the earning capacity of that land. There are many other factors at play in, in determining uh, what the market will pay for, for land. Um, 
but there's no relationship whatsoever between the capital value and the rental value of, of agricultural land. Uh, Nigel Miller. Um, I, I guess you know, you know, I, I agree with that, but I, I think you know, your, your view of the world, I mean, I have some sympathy with this because we, we seem to have you know, got detached from reality in many ways. Uh, I, I guess that uh, you know, that isn't helpful for the industry, really. Uh, the reality is that, that we're almost uh, caught in a vice because a lot of uh, farmers' borrowings are based on the value of their land. So yeah. if we interfere with that, you know, a lot of farmers may, may get into trouble. But the, the, uh, to me, you know, there is probably a tax issue if there is you know, major investment coming into farmland because of the favourable uh, tax environment that you can uh, uh, find there, then you, you should be hooking that into uh, how they use the land. And if investors are buying land at that very high level uh, and then letting it out, then that's pretty good. If they're uh, not and it's all in hand or it's contract farming, which sometimes contract farming groups aren't as balanced as we'd like them to be, to be honest, uh, uh, you know, maybe that isn't so good. So I think that if people are going to get a tax shelter in there, there must be some sort of linkage about how you use that land. And hopefully that would mean that outside investment would actually open up opportunities rather than close them down. Well, indeed. And it's this issue about um, when people say about landlords wishing to invest uh, and then looking for a return. And, and it seems to me that if a landlord has bought land at a very high price, you know, that that is going to drive the whole market in, in, in renting and so on. And we see from the statistics the loss of land that there has been for renting over uh, the piece, and the statistics are quite clear. It's not all gone into shorter tenancies. There's land actually been removed from farming in Scotland at a time when we're looking for the outcome of having more local production. Um, therefore, there's something very far wrong with a system that can allow the, the open market sale and buying of land in the way that it has, if it's actually going to lead to less land actually being available uh, to people to use for the fundamental purpose that we're supporting from a government and from the European Union. Yeah, Martin? I think that's part of the challenge of, of yourselves and of the group is to create the right environment that it's attractive for those that are investing in land to, to want to, to let it. And that's about, um, so it's about confidence, it's about um, creating um, sufficient flexibility that, the, that uh, those buying land feel confident to want to enter into letting arrangements. Do you think that uh, the mutual respect then and partnership between owners and tenants are seriously affected by these outside factors, uh, the factors related to um, the saleable value of land and the way in which investment is seen by some people as a means to get the return uh, through probably selling it on? Uh, um, per personally, I, I, don't, I don't see that in the real world. I don't see that that, that, um, that, relation, that affects the relationship, this mutual respect um, arrangement. You know, the, um, mutual respect is, um, is either been developed over time between two parties or it's because they're entering into new arrangements um, and, and uh, therefore coming at it at the same time in, in, with, with their eyes open rather than carrying perhaps baggage from, from previous times. Okay. Uh, Graham Day wants to ask about Yes, if I, may, you know, I don't want to go off at a tangent, but I want to raise something in, in the context of talking about mutual respect and partnership between owners and, and tenants. If that aspiration is to be achieved, isn't the spirit and the nature of the conduct of rent reviews as important a component as, as the system itself? And if we're to accept that to be the case, don't we need to look at who's actually pursuing the negotiations on behalf of the landowners? Because isn't it better all round to have uh, the locally based factors conducting the negotiations rather than bringing in um, hard hitters from outside? And I think when people have to rub along uh, with each other after the dust has settled on a rent review, uh, aren't we going to see the negotiations conducted in a more cordial, common sense way if it's um, an individual who's put a part of the fabric of an estate or, or works with the tenants regularly rather than someone who's brought in from outside? Because certainly you will have far greater experience than I do in this area, but certainly the instances I hear of where there has been a lot of resentment generated by a rent review, it has tended more to be when an outsider has come in to conduct it rather than the person who's operating on the ground. Let's take that. 
Christopher Nicholson. Yes. That's cer certainly true, and um, it's becoming more and more of a fashion and common nowadays for outside agents from further away to come and conduct rent, rent reviews, even in, in, on estates where there are resident factors, the rent reviews are left to a, a third party from, from outside. We've, I agree completely that if everyone has to rub along afterwards, then um, we develop more respect and, and things, the process becomes smoother. Um, the, the process is, is very important. Um, the TFF have developed guidelines um, to help that process um, uh, to a certain extent, it's difficult to persuade everyone to follow those guidelines if they were enshrined, enshrined in, a, in a code that has a bit more teeth than it might, might work. Um, there is also appetite, amongst, certainly amongst tenants, to see the, 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 the setting of rents taken out of the hands of landlords and tenants so that there is, for example, more like the French system whereby a a local panel or, or, or a part of the section of the Department of Agriculture or a rents adjudicator, someone like that, a body like that, is, has the power to um, set rents or recommend rent changes according to the circumstances in, in a certain area. And Nigel Miller, and then David Johnson. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't think anybody could disagree with what you say, really, uh, the, but the, that's the reality of the world we're in. I guess that uh, uh, you know, the, the, the guidance of uh, rent determination and the practitioner's guide is key, and uh, you know, if that was mandatory, maybe that would be a good thing, so we're probably in the same place as Chris. Uh, but I think that the, the basic point of having that ongoing relationship is a key one, making sure that uh, you know, both parties meet up regularly, and therefore, even if there isn't any change in rent, there certainly should be some sort of process within that process process, you should be looking at the holding and also having a, 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 an inventory of improvements or changes in that holding to make sure that doesn't slip away because there's points of contention when that doesn't happen. If you are going to use an outside agent, you know, there should be some designated point of contact, even if it's a trust, there should be some face that deals with that tenant year in, year out as a contact. And that doesn't happen on, on some trusts. And I think that, you know, it, it sounds a bit frilly, but you know, the reality is I think that you've got to the heart of one of the big issues is, is that that fracture of relationships uh, which uh, uh, you know, then goes badly wrong. Yes. Um, to, to support Nigel, I, I think, in, in a lot of this, um, the key to doing the rent reviews is they've got to be done in, in a way that follows the guide and is mutually respectful in all parties. Um, they are complicated to do with the way legislation is, is framed and um, Outside parties are, are brought in to uh, bring a knowledge to doing the rent review, and this has, without doubt, caused um, friction, which is why within the, the TFF this, this guide was created to, to follow. Um, there is um, an uptake in this guide. It is uh, to be uh, taken up more and followed more, um, but to... Um, limit the, the, the people who are doing it to, to local people is, is quite difficult. You also have within this, I think, um, we, we lose sight of the fact that you have bigger states and smaller states. So the bigger states have a resident factor and they can bring in outside people to help. There's an awful lot of um, very small landowners who might have one or two tentative farms who don't have resident factors, who don't have uh, people. They are the people on the point of contact who, who the tenants deal with directly. But they simply do not have the knowledge to um, do these rent reviews. Uh, so they do bring in outside people. I fully support Nigel. I think there should be a clear point of contact for um, that particular tenant to deal with so they know who they've got to go to, whether it's the trust. But that equally applies to um, land held by the Scottish Government or Forest Commission and all the rest of it. Um, they have the factoring team there revolves uh, from time to time. So you end up losing that relationship that you built up. It's not perfect, but it's definitely there to be improved. Um, it would be interesting, just at this point, a sub, sub, uh, supplement to that, you know, to say between the NFU, the SLE and the STFA, you've agreed this reasonableness test. Uh, what's the response of uh, Rex, Andrew Wood? We, we have no issue with it at all. Um, we, we, like the Law Society, are there to, to, to follow the law and apply it as it's, um, as it's been drafted and, and created. And um, the, the, the reasonableness test, 
you know, the difficulty uh, I can see in a very, very small number of cases. And, and I think, you know, we're, we're highlighting quite a few things here, but, but we have no feel for the quantum of a lot of these things. And actually, there have been, as, as, uh, as, as Graham Day uh, highlighted, you know, there's been one or two issues where things have been, you know, unpalatable. And, and they are not being defended by the RICS. Um, and I think the way some of the business was done in those, those you know, small number of cases was, was unsatisfactory. Um, we have a worldwide code of conduct. We have continually encouraged people to come forward if they feel that that is being breached. Uh, it, it has real teeth. Um, it puts people uh, in very difficult circumstances and potentially ends their careers. So, um, and and I've, I've brought some copies here, you know, if people want to see it uh, later on. Um, the, it is a complex process, and I think that the, the, the thing that was highlighted about um, the vast majority of people not having, you know, agents uh, or full-time agents often, because they, you know, the, the range of people that own tenanted farms is vast, from, from small charities to, to individuals who may have one farm that their grandfather had, you know, right through to the, the large estates. Um, the, the reasonableness test, we, we have no issue with. Um, the difficulty is that there will be, you know, concerns about how it's applied. We don't know, particularly as rent reviews only happen very infrequently in some instances. And, and I mean, that goes back to this relationship issue is that sometimes, you know, six or nine years elapse between rent reviews. And therefore, you know, it's, it, it's not something that some people on either side of the, of the table do regularly. And, and that can cause difficulties. Um, so, you know, there is an issue there in terms of the, the frequency and the, the, uh, the code of conduct and the, and the code that came out from the TFF is very new. Um, it's only been in place for, for a year. Um, there will be rent reviews that may not be conducted in line with that code for, you know, some years with individuals. So we just have to, I think, give that some time for, for, for take-up, um, and, and hopefully, and I think there's a lot of pressure within the industry to make that work and, and see how it improves relations. Okay. I will move on to the right by now. Graham Day. Right, thank you, Kimura. Getting down to the nitty-gritty, as it were. In terms of the right to buy, does the panel accept there should be a right to buy for 1991 Act tenancies? And when the review talks of undertaking further work, analysing the wider potential implications of such a development for the Scottish economy beyond the sector itself, what factors ought to be taken into account in determining the public interest in this? Public interest, right to buy. Who wants to kick off on that? Nigel? Um, this is something you know, we've obviously consulted with uh, members on you know, right around the country, and, and there is quite a a regional variation between tenants on this view, uh, maybe reflecting the environment they're working in. Uh, and we've obviously you know, worked with our you know, landowning members as well, so we, we've probably seen both sides of the picture. Uh, the reality is I think that those that are, you know, see it as an imperative or those that feel that the, the system they're working under is totally dysfunctional and there's been no investment and no opportunity in the, in the region they're working. And I think they've found that dispiriting, not just for themselves, but for the whole community. And I think there is, you know, if you actually, you know, I'm sure you yourselves have experienced that, and, and uh, you know, there is something that's got to be addressed there. Uh, I think that, you know, where we are, which is really where we were in our submission, was that, you know, where we have got a system which is dysfunctional and, and uh, you know, you know, obviously doesn't deliver... Uh, 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 then you know, some sort of intervention is required, and we've suggested uh, you know, so, and a duty you know, moving in with a compulsory purchase and then disposing of the farms or, or letting them accordingly afterwards to, to break the cycle. And to be honest, that would also, uh, you know, both in our tenants and our landowners' view, flip over uh, in, in uh, instances where tenants you know, didn't actually fulfil fulfill their basic obligations as well. Uh, and so it, it is very much a targeted intervention. And our view is that that hopefully is a driver to actually improve things. If it doesn't improve things, then there is a real intervention to sort this. And it means that those that do have good relationships and those that do actually do a good job of letting land are not actually uh, compromised by it 
and that the, the atmosphere that we work in is hopefully positive in the future. So it's a balance, and, and I know we've got members on, you know, that you are pretty critical of where we are, think it's too interventionist. We've also got members that, you know, believe that an absolute right to buy, a general absolute right to buy, is the solution. So, you know, this isn't a, a, a unanimous view by any means, but I think it's a balance that, you know, the majority of our membership believe is, is you know, probably about right. Um, STFA are, are supportive of the um, approach the, the review group have taken to a, a right to buy in looking at its role in um, land diversification and allowing further investment in, in farms in cases where, where it's clearly in the, in the public interest. Um, there, are, there are possibly circumstances where you're not considering a whole farm right to buy, but a right to buy of a certain section of a farm or, or a, a, a site of a d diversification or development on the farm that would allow um, a, a tenant to um, you, a better use of bank finance to develop a farm shop or a wind turbine or, or what, whatever. Um, the, the, I know the review group are looking at other measures that may allow um, promote um, an investment in the in the tenanted sector by tenants, such as assignation of, of um, freedom of assignation of leases. But the the ability of a tenant to invest is a, is a is a key driver for the desire for a, a, a right to buy amongst tenants. And the evidence of where tenants have bought their farms in the last 10, 20 years is that there is, following the purchase of that farm, there is a a, a leap forward in terms of investment and quality of investment on that, that holding. And by purchasing the farm, the, the tenant is, um, is not having to pay for his past improvements, um, so he's purchasing the farm at a discount to open market value. But once he's purchased that farm, those are, the value of those improvements, past improvements, are available to him to increase his borrowing power to make further improvements. And that's a real flaw at the moment in the tenant's system in the business model that you can't, as a tenant, you can't use your past improvements as collateral to fund future improvements. Um, and, and many people see right to buy as the only solution to that problem. But I know the review group are working on um, terms of assignation to, to look at that as well. Martin Mahal. Um, mm. as, a, as a sort of overriding principle, um, Sava believe that the, nothing will kill off the land sector quicker than introducing a right to buy. Um, it, for two reasons. A, it takes a whole chunk of land out of the land sector. And secondly, it will undermine um, those that own land from ever wanting to let land again. So you know, it, it, um, it would certainly be a step change, but it would, um, in our view, um, would... would uh, kill off the let sector as it as it as we currently know it. Um, could I pick up on one of, of Christopher's points because it's a very valid point is about the the borrowing capacity and then the ability to invest because we in, under our research that we've been doing whilst we've been developing our paper here was that we've um, discovered that in Scotland is, is quite a different situation to what happens south of the border where tenants can borrow against their tenants improvements and and their way go. Um, as, as part of, the, of their um, um, borrowing ability, whereas in Scotland, generally, banks do not take that view. And I think that needs to be perhaps looked into a bit further. Given it's the same bank. Yes. <coughs> David Johnson. Um, David Lager. The, the, the right to buy, um, you know, I'm surprised that we're not in, in favour of that. I think that... Um, it's coming about by um, issues and frustrations that have been developing over a very, very long period of time, which haven't been um, addressed satisfactorily. And this has created this um, groundswell of, of frustration that is needing to be addressed. And for us, this is what the purpose of the review is, is to, is to iron out all of these um, um, points that uh, people are, are having difficulty with, find solutions to them so that we can then drive the industry forward with confidence that people have the confidence to let uh, more land into the market. Um, Martin is, is, is absolutely right. The, the way going is uh, a problematic area at the moment. Um, 
you, we have a, there are tenants who have not served the, the correct notice, who are therefore not technically eligible to receive um, compensation where going when they when they leave the tenancy. Uh, we, as an organisation, think that's wrong. We think that, um, as we propose within our evidence, that it should be an amnesty, and fundamentally that if um, a tenant made a valid improvement to the holding, they should receive fair compensation for that improvement, um, and um, that would give a. The ability to, to, to borrow against that uh, would have a great deal of traction and start to free up some of this um, security that is needed to um, fund the improvements. Um, Andrew Wood. Mr Chairman, um, just picking up a number of things. Um, the, the right to buy, um, the, one, of the, one of the points you raised earlier about people investing in land to let, um, the introduction of the right to buy um, I mean, I've sold more farms to tenants than most, probably, um, is a real barrier to investment uh, because there is a per perceived confidence issue in investors because of the right to buy. Um, so that's something that just needs to be considered. Um, the, uh, the borrowings issue, the banks actually, in many instances, whether you're an owner-occupier or a tenant, are moving much more to look at your, your business finances, your cash flow and your ability to repay, rather than purely the collateral that is set against that. And there is there's quite a move in it with most of the banks um, that we're finding you know, throughout the agricultural sector um, that, that it, it doesn't really matter how much collateral you've got. They would like to know that there's some, but what they're really looking at, because they've been so heavily criticized, quite rightly, in some sectors, uh, for not looking at the ability of, 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 of people to repay and, and, the, and the liquidity within the business. So <clears throat> I think there's, there's, you know, there's certainly an opportunity for further dialogue on that. And the, um, the, the last thing uh, really is to do with uh, compensation at Wago. I think everybody you know, recognises there were some inappropriate deals done in the past. I, I would stress that they were in the past. And I, I'm, I, I mean, the amnesty, I think, is a really good idea. Uh, just in, in light of recent issues with retrospective legislation, I think we just need to be very careful how we treat that um, from, a, from a wider perspective. I, I'm interested, to, uh, yes, Nigel, in a minute. Um, just, you know, we're going to have to pin something down here. The, the, page 27 in the, the full interim report points out that there are 1,006 fewer holdings since 2007. 254,291 hectares less in uh, agricultural tenancies. Martin Hall, are you telling me that it's the right to buy that has taken that land out of uh, use? No, I'm not. Um, the, the, um, I, I'm, uh, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but I imagine a large number of those holdings have, are, have been sold through voluntary negotiation with their, with their tenants. If that's the case, that's obviously a statistic that would be very helpful for us if actually that land is in agriculture, but it's actually been sold on. So the amount of land which has been sold on uh, and is in agriculture, but less in tenancy and now in ownership, it would be something that's central to our understanding of this particular problem. Andrew Wood. Uh, Mr Chairman, it's one of the points I was making earlier about, about statistics and data, <clears throat> because um, there, there is a significant proportion. I mean, I would think most of that land is still in agricultural production. Uh, but, I mean, you know, personally, there, I know of a large number of farms that have been sold to tenants. Um, so, you know, it's come out of the tenanted sector. OK. Um, Nigel Miller wanted to comment on this, and then Dave Thompson wants another question just there. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I really just a gap in what I'd said. Obviously, we didn't touch on the preemptive right, and I think that you know, just to be clear on the record that we support you know, the, the use of the preemptive right, I think there is a consensus about that. We believe that it probably should be automatic. The fact that only, I think, just over 20% of tenants actually register something, it seems quite strange to us, and there are sort of tensions within that registration process that we believe you know, aren't helpful, and uh, you know, that would be you know, a fairly you know, uncontroversial thing to do. But as far as the investment goes, I think you know, Chris's point is valid. 
you know, both for diversification and for, you know, we're seeing increasingly, you know, tenants with, you know, multiple uh, 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 land holdings, you know, putting either a grain store or a dairy on a tented unit, uh, which is, is far beyond the capacity of that one holding. And the reality, that's, that's a real nightmare for the landowner and for the tenant, because the present way going would exclude its, its compensation. You know, I think that uh, in, in both the diversification and in that case, there may well be some uh, uh, sense in, in that being you know, taken out of the, the agricultural tenancy and put into some sort of uh, you know, business, uh, tenant, uh, business let that, that can then has value and can be, be sold to another party if necessary. Now, in some units, that, that might be helpful. Yeah, Dave, uh, Dave Thompson. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, if I could I'd like to move on to the, the whole issue of assignation because I, I think that uh, it may in fact deal with quite a number of the problems and the issues that we've been discussing today and, and, and will continue to um, discuss. If the mem members of the panel would, would give me their views on whether they think giving the right to 91 tenants, the right to assign their tenancy, their lease or whatever, um, would help um, to allow them to develop their holdings because obviously if they can assign then the value that they add to the, to the holding would be taken into account in relation to what they would get um, from the person taking over uh, the lease. It would deal with issues um, to do with Wago because, you know, it would be built in in terms of the, the price that they would get. So any improvements that the tenant made would be handed back to them once they assigned their lease to a third party um, because that would be built into the value of the lease. Um, it would allow them as well, I would imagine, to um, better approach the banks for, you know, the, the, the collateral is there. I mean, we've had evidence um, on visits to farms that the, the tenants are having real problems in getting raising finance, very go-ahead farmers who cannot raise finance other than if they've got some other property they can put down as security, that what they've done on their, on their farm and, and their vision for the future just isn't enough for some of the banks uh, to, to lend to them. So I would like to... Um, Get, a, get the views uh, on assignation as a possible answer to a number of the issues that we've been discussing. To the whole area of uh, establishing a stable and effective framework, so fine. That's uh, possibly what a lot of people would want. Christopher? Um, yes, assignation is um, potentially, potentially a real um, game changer for the viability of secure tenants in terms of um, ensuring investment continues in the future. Without, without investment, all holdings eventually become unviable, um, and, and investment is the key to going forward. And I think a lot, a lot of the holdings that have fallen out of the tenanted sector in, in recent years are holdings that have possibly become unviable through lack of, lack of investment, and, and they're now being um, used as an addition to other, other holdings. Um, assignation can solve, in, in principle, um, assignation can solve m m many problems. It can solve the investment problem because it allows a lease to have value, and where, when a tenant invests, it increases the lease of the, va the value of the lease, and that lease could be held as a security by, by a, a finance provider. Um, I, I accept that there are details that have to be ironed out, but the principle is, is there, and I think the review group are working on that. Um, in terms of WAGO for secure tenancies, it can cut out the uncertain and difficult process of WAGO because instead of going through the compensation for WAGO for tenants' improvements, that a retiring tenant without successors simply um, sells his lease and receives value that way, and I think that would be a clearer, fairer, and, and more certain way of receiving value for the tenant. It also um, allows the landlord not to have to worry about future cash flow requirements for paying tenants out for their, for their compensation. And I think if you look in the very, very long term, um, given that open assignation um, allows a tenant a better ability to invest, you probably could remove um, as a trade-off some of the requirements of a landlord to provide fixed equipment. Uh, and, uh, and, and so there, there, there are benefits to both parties. 
and a key to one of the key benefits of assignation in terms of fluidity in the sector and bringing life back into the sector is that it allows a retiring tenant um, to pass on his t tenancy to, if he hasn't got successors, to, to an, an incoming new, new entrant. And you, the, there are tenancies come in all shapes and sizes, so some of them are suitable for a new entrant who's looking to farm part-time. Um, that if he builds up his business and looks, is looking for a, a larger holding, he could assign his existing holding to another new entrant and, and match himself up with a retiring tenant coming out of a bigger holding with no, no successes. At the moment, there's somewhere between 100 and 200 tenancies falling out of the system through lack of succession. And even if just a, a small portion of those were assigned to new entrants, you'd solve the new entrant problem. And you wouldn't just solve the starter unit problem, you would also allow them a ladder to progress beyond the starter units. If we, if we compare ourselves to the English situation, the English have almost 3,000 starter units on county council holdings, which we don't have, um, but, the, but there is no, no progression for them beyond that. But freedom of assignation would allow progression beyond that stage into a secure tenancy, which is the best vehicle we have to generate investment and, and ensure viability of those holdings. speak. In your view, would it also reduce the pressure in terms of a desire to have a right to buy? Because if the, would the assignation almost do for tenants, well, a good part of what actually ownership would do? So would it reduce that? Uh? In, in, in many circumstances, it would do that. And looking at tenancies from a purely business perspective, that would be the case. Um, there are always those um, st stakeholders who are interested in further land reform outside tenanted sectors and right to buy will always come into that debate. But from the perspective of a tenant looking to invest, then it, it possibly could go a long way to taking that pressure away. Um, although at the moment we're just looking at the principle and the details need to be mm. ironed out. Thank you. Uh, Jamie McGregor wants to talk about Wago, I think. Yes, I did. The, the, um, the report on page 75 uh, says that a range of economic, social and cultural issues underpin the current dissatisfaction. And then it goes on to outline uh, the number of important issues for consideration, one of which is improvements, compensation and Wago. And um, we've already heard some talk about this from the panels. It obviously is an important point. Uh, and I understand that it's... a about tenant farmers, the dissatisfaction comes from the fact that tenant farmers are not getting sufficient compensation, but often the tenant farmers have not properly notified. Now, what I really would like to know is, that perhaps from SLE, I, I notice they may mention this in their written evidence, uh, about this amnesty for people giving notification, what it exactly means, and if it, you can tell us just a bit more about how this would, um, you know, um, cope with this area of dissatisfaction? Uh, certainly, I've on this on, on, already. Um, it, it comes down to what we've talked about, these notices that have to be served to uh, notify the landlord of um, uh, an improvement that's been done. And certainly in the past, these notices quite often have not been served correctly or, or not done at all. And as a result, when a tenant wishes to leave the holding um, with no notice, there's no legal framework to, to ask for the compensation. Uh, we think that's, that, that's fundamentally wrong. And we think that if the improvement is valid to the holding, um, then it should have a value, irrespective of whether the notice is served or not. Now, this also should apply to um, cases, we think, where the tenant did serve the notice and it's been time expired because you had, you had write-down agreements for 5, 10, 15 years, but what is there is still relevant and pertinent to the holding, and as such should have a value and should, should do fair, reasonable compensation with regards to that. So that is a method we see as uh, to encourage the investment because we know that at the end of the day you will get uh, the compensation that, it, that is due at the end of it. So is the one year a sort of arbitrary figure? I mean, it, it, the amnesty? Yes. Well, I mean, there, there is, I think Nigel in FUS's submission uh, suggested that we could do it on a three-year cycle because that would tie in with all the uh, rent reviews and it would form part of a natural process for doing so. So there's a lot of sense in what 
Nigel suggests with uh, doing it over a period of, of the rent review period. Yes, all right. Um, does anyone else want to com just comment on that? Context. When, after the last war, um, the, the then Labour government were considering how to stop Britain running out of food again, the answer in Scotland was the 1948 Act, which introduced for the first time security of tenure. And the concept set out in that bill, uh, which was enacted and then uh, consolidated in 1949, was that the, 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 the chips were all with the tenant. The cost to the tenant was to comply with what now everyone agrees are footling, noinsome requirements to make notice in certain ways at certain times for certain purposes. It is completely out of date and should be top of the bill for reorganisation. That's where it comes from. Christopher? Just a, a couple of points. Um, although assignation can, could bypass the WAGO problem for secure tenants, WAGO is still a fundamental issue, will still be a fundamental issue for the limited duration tenants and, and limited partnership tenants. So it is a, a bit of legislation that needs to be sorted out. And, and as tenants, as representative tenants, we're um, very um, pleased by the progress that, that SLE and, and other stakeholders have made in recognising that, that, that there should be an amnesty or a moratorium and, and, um, and, and tenants be allowed to catch up with the registration of their improvements. Um, going back to the serving of notices, we must remember that there are a whole list of improvements in the, in the legislation that require no notice, particularly improvements to, to land like rock removal, stone removal, etc. So there's actually no paper record of those improvements and it's probably fundamental to the um, relationships in the sector going forward that say at rent reviews or, or somewhere there is a, a register that's updated regularly of a record of tenants improvements to avoid disputes um, at a later later stage especially with the age of some of the tenancies now the average tenancy is over over 50 years old that's just going to get longer and we need good records because we're getting out of um, people's recent memories in terms of some of the improvements thank you Nigel Moore. Just to underline the importance of getting the way go right, uh, I think you know, there's a focus now on assignation. I think there's a, a sort of real drive, you know, probably within, within our, our own membership, but I think also with the review group, to really look at that. Um, I, I'm not sure that assignation is necessarily the political fix that uh, we all think it is. The reality is that if we go to assignation for value, it won't be people that are second rung on the ladder or new entrants that get these holdings, it'll be fat cats like me that get it because we've got the money and we've got the farms already, we've got the marriage value, we've got the capital behind us. Well, maybe I haven't, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of us have. And if you're a new entrant or you go up the ladder, you're going to get squeezed out. And so if, if you really think that this is going to be a useful tool, you've actually got to limit the number of people who can, or the limit the class of people that can bid for these assigned uh, 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 farms and that means that the tenant will not get the same value as he would do if it was in the open market that's the reality and therefore some sort of intervention for a government is required and probably some sort of support through pillar two is required to oil those wheels to make it work uh, and and i think you know by all means if you want to see agricultural consolidated to larger larger businesses assignation for value makes perfect sense but if you want it to actually be more diverse then you've actually got to be more interventionist uh, and i think you know the other issue is that you know, if we're going to assign to a, 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 you know, a full uh, tenancy, how many landowners are going to stand by and let that happen without actually intervening and offering the tenant a big chunk of money to assign it back to the, the state or, or to drop the tenancy? The reality is flipping it over to an LDT for a, a lifetime tenancy or 25 years probably is a lot more equitable and makes sense. So I think those are the sort of the nasty compromises <coughs> in what seems to be a fantastic solution which solves all your problems. Um, there's a number of people want to come in on this. Uh, Christopher first. Yeah, I, I, I back um, I support Nigel's comment that you do need restrictions on, on ass assignation if, if that's part of public policy that holdings shouldn't get become over, over large. And, and we see it as a role of a, a commission, commission or tenancy adjudicator in the, in the future. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's all I want to say. Yeah, sure. 
Um, did David Johnson want to say something there? Or is it yes, just to come in on, on the point of view of assignation. Um, it's, it's quite a complex one on, on, on the psychological message it sends out to, to the landowners who it would affect. Um, we know and we understand the security of tenure and, and, and how that uh, affects it. Uh, there's also the pattern where these tenancies started off on, on a limited term and they have uh, altered into um, the long-term secure tenancies that, that we have now. If part of the review is to encourage new letting within the industry and more people to come forward, my worry here is that by introducing what would be a major retrospective alteration of the letting arrangement between the tenant and the, and the landlord, will send a message that your arrangements that you have at present or the new ones you're going to go into may be altered again at a later date into the future. And so it starts to dramatically affect uh, confidence, which is not what we need to do. We need more confidence within the system, more stability. Um, the, the option that Nigel talked about uh, of rather than assigning a 91 Act tenancy to another 91 Act tenancy of, if you like, converting it to an LDT where we know we have a fixed term um, is an interesting one, and I think one which SLE would, would, would like to explore a bit more. Um, but it would be to uh, an LDT of, of a fairly lengthy period, probably 20, 25 years. Um, I think it would also help to um, re-establish that area of the tenanted sector and create a vibrancy and a, and a, a trading within the LDTs. Um, with regards to the, the, the value of it, uh, LDTs at the moment themselves are um, assignable for value. So you can put them on the market and, and, and do so. Uh, as far as I'm aware, nobody within an LDT has ever secured borrowing from a bank to, against the value of an LDT. So I don't know how the banks are, are viewing that. I don't know if anybody else has any experience of, of that as a methodology. So we need to be a little bit careful about it being the panacea that it might otherwise appear to be simply and there's more complex issues needing to be ironed out within it. Nigel Don. Thank you, Convener. Yeah, I, I, good morning, gentlemen. Um, it seems to me that the, the conversation has suddenly got much more lively, and you know, we've suddenly got to sort of the, the, the sharp end of, of some of the, the, the issues that you're grappling with. I'm wondering, therefore, if I could just drag you back just a, a little bit, given that we're kind of legislators in all of this, well, we are legislators in all of this, um, We've got a tenancies review, which we're talking about. We've got a land reform review, which is ongoing and which you all know about. I'm conscious that in 1925, the UK Parliament legislated right across the area of land and equities and trusts in order to try and clear the ground, dreadful pun, um, of the law of the UK on this. Uh, I, I'm just wondering whether there are other areas, and to some extent I'm looking at Mike as I'm saying this, other areas, maybe taxation, maybe to do with registration, sorry, registration, maybe trust law itself, which we should be looking at at the same time as trying to get these very practical solutions to land use and land tenancies. Has anybody thought about what else we should be doing at the same time? Um, I should suggest that the Act of 25 that you're referring to refer did not affect Scotland. Correct. Yes. Um, I'm not very sure in what context you raised it. Then. I, I, I'm forgive me, I'm raising it in the context that it did an awful lot for English land law. Right. It actually settled a whole lot out and they did it in a one And I'm wondering whether something appropriate should be, do, should be done in Scotland at the same time. Now. I, as I understand it, and my colleagues will tell, tell you if I'm right, right or wrong, um, the, the position in Scotland is that any entity may own land agricultural land in particular, and may choose not or to, to, to let it or not to let it. I don't see that there is any interest in looking at the, ma the machinery for trusts or limited companies or LLPs or any other entities which has a bearing on what we're trying to do, which is to sort out some of the ills of the tenanted sector. Okay, can I, sorry, can I just... Please that out there. Am, am I right in thinking that it's not obvious to yourselves that there's anything else that we should be doing at the same time? There are no other legal barriers to the well, aspirations there, there is, that there we're is talking one. about. I mean, this is a tiny one, but it's just worth mentioning in this context. Um, as the common law in Scotland has it at present, 
um, it is the right of the landlord to choose who his tenant is, and that therefore an automatic right of assignation by the tenant will require an, uh, an alteration to the Scots law. Right. <coughs> but that's for Parliament to do. Okay. In general, then, to the rest of the panel, do other stakeholders see other issues that are lurking out there which we need to address at the same time? Or are you feeling that the things which we're trying to deal with at the moment in land reform and tenancy reform are actually capable of being done within the context of the two reviews we're currently talking about? One of the factors that we've highlighted in our paper is, is, um, is it's not access to land, but access to finance is a, is, is a real barrier. And, we, and um, that, that's something that's separate and, and uh, not something mm -hmm. we're here today to discuss, but it is a factor that's at play in, in this whole discussion for tenants. Uh, I'm not a, a legal sort of person or, 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 or a tax expert, but I mean, to me, you know, the, and, and you know, obviously tax is something which, you know, or some is, is uh, a present reserve, but, you know, maybe after uh, you know, September won't be, so maybe it's, it's, it's your job to sort it. But, I mean, the reality is that, you know, agricultural property relief, you know, inheritance law, these are things which have, a, a, or business property relief, have a big impact on people's decision-making, what makes sense. Uh, and my view is that they should be uh, designed so that they incentivise, you know, the, the uh, uh, you know, a vibrant rural community and incentivise best practice. And therefore, they should be available for those that deliver, and they shouldn't be available for those that don't. These are sort of pretty, you know, uh, solid tools. But I think you should be looking at those. And, and you know, obviously, the, the land reform group have, have highlighted various examples. But, uh, but to me, the the the, the that they're an incentive to actually drive the behaviour you want. Uh, and we all want, so you know, uh, I think it should be used in that way. Um, really, just to echo what Nigel has said, that um, taxation issues and CAP are, are cross-cutting issues that affect the tenanted, tenanted sector. Um, for, for, for example, um, earlier we mentioned, there was mention of contract farming agreements. Well, m many of these contract farming agreements are really sham rental agreements designed to allow the landowner a fixed rental without risk for his land, but enable him to have trading status for tax purposes. So we actually have a fiscal system at the moment that is a disincentive to let land. We also have some very generous tax breaks on land ownership, for example, 100% um, inheritance tax relief. Now, is, is there a public interest argument that, that, that supports that tax relief on land that is simply let out on very short-term leases. There are, there are many questions for, the, for taxation. I, I know it's not a devolved power at the moment, but it may well be in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, just one point of sort of administration. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Apologies, convener. Um, uh, the RICS's paper and submission to the um, review group does not seem to have been included in your pack, um, and uh, certainly in the papers I got. Uh, I don't know if everybody else has got them, but there is a point in there just about legislation creep uh, and looking at the, the, the number of uh, changes we've had in agricultural holdings legislation over a very short period of time. And I think you know that, again, from a confidence issue, is something we just need to be uh, aware of. Yeah. Um, the papers weren't probably sent to the clerks here, so that would be the reason why we don't have them. So we'd be happy to accept it uh, now as uh, part of our reflection before the next panel. Thank you very much indeed. Not at all. Um, we've been talking about creating new and flexible frameworks to stimulate diverse other arrangements. Angus MacDonald wants to take that forward, and then Claudia Beamish. Okay, um, thank you, uh, convener. If uh, as you say, if we could look briefly at other um, tenure arrangements and um, go on to Small Landholders Act. Um, the panel will be aware of uh, the Cook Report of 2009, which uh, reviewed routes into, into farming and highlighted a staged entry for uh, new entrants as they uh, gradually accumulate uh, the experience and skills culminating in the um, tenancy being the final stage. Now, um, we see various arrangements used in Scotland, including uh, incentivised employment contracts, uh, share farming, equity arrangements and partnerships, 
and contract farming and contract growing, which has just, just been mentioned. Um, can I ask the panel to, to comment on what other tenancy arrangements uh, would help meet the Scottish Government's vision uh, for the agricultural uh, tenant sector, and what regulation, if any, is needed for the other arrangements that farmers use to share uh, control of land? We want to start. Andrew Wood. Um, the RSS has taken a view for some time that uh, the ability to have a freedom of contract type tenancy uh, would would be uh, a good thing in terms of uh, availability of land. Um, I think that um, you know we've, we've got uh, SLDTs and LDTs which are, are doing a, a pretty good job, but they still have quite a few um, constraints attached to them. Um, and uh, potentially uh, certain contract farming and partnership arrangements, which are quite complex to operate, and quite expensive to operate, would change into um, an open market type tenancy. Okay. Anyone else, Nigel? Um, we've you know looked at this a bit, and, and uh, we've always looked for a silver bullet, and we've never really found one, which is which is unfortunate. But I think that uh, uh, there are real disincentives for uh, landowners to let out part-time units, uh, and I think we've got to break through that because. The reality is most people on the, uh, getting into the farming ladder are going to be part-time for various reasons, for capital reasons, uh, and they may well have to have another job. Uh, if we're going to uh, uh, encourage that, there must be some sort of incentive for the landowner to do it. And one of the, the flexibilities they probably need is, is around the housing side of it, because uh, uh, a lot of these units, the, the, the house is actually of more value in letting terms than the actual farm unit. Uh, and it may be that uh, you know, some sort of uh, uh, proactive intervention on, on planning guidance would be helpful to allow another house to be built, uh, let out the farmhouse maybe as a separate uh, private dwelling, but have a reasonable house which you know, is appropriate for a young family uh, and, and, and uh, you know, with a small farm with it. Uh, and that would be hopefully positive for both sides. So, so that sort of flexibility might open up new units. I think the other uh, area where we think there's scope is... Uh, uh, you know, looking at some sort of LDT for, for renovation, which means that you get a peppercorn rent, you know, some sort of security for the medium or long term, uh, uh, but hopefully a decent uh, WAGO package, which is well defined at the beginning. Uh, and I think there are real incentives, you know, for some of the larger estates or some of the West where farming has sort of dropped off their priorities, where they've actually got what uh, uh, land which was previously in agricultural holdings and is now being used very extensively for grazing. And I think that, you know, if, if, if we look at land use, the, the, there should be some sort of incentive there or some sort of pressure there to uh, you know, give young people a chance to get hold of that land uh, uh, and, and, and get some sort of step on the ladder. Uh, the other sort of area which you know, is worth looking at is you know, temporary grazings and things like this, which are a very easy option for uh, landowners and farmers, and they're a very important part of the market for many farmers. But the reality is that uh, they're high rent and they're often low investment. Some places their investment is good, but some cases it isn't. And I think that if people are paying high rent, especially new entrants, there must be some investment from the uh, landowner to ensure that the fencing and the uh, lime status and the, the, the basic fertility is maintained. Uh, and I think those sort of standards should be built into the short light market. Thank you. Uh, David Jones. Um, yes, the, the, I think the temporary grazings are... Um, are not ideal. I think they are. They are. They have a, the place in the market for for uh, helping out various farmers, but they are being used at the moment for a uh, stopgap while the review is going on until we see where we where we end up. The the uh, we have the SLDTs and the LDTs, which broadly speaking we think are quite um, suitable vehicles, uh, but there are room for improvements within there um, to be able to have the full repairing leases that Nigel talks about offsetting low rents against a commitment to improve and the way goings at the end offers greater flexibility within that. Um, I think it's complicated to have the SLDTs and the LDTs. In an ideal world, we should be able to have one vehicle that would be able to cover both of those um, uh, time frames. But build in the flexibility that allows the creativity that's out there to be um, drawn out of people and, and find arrangements that suit them. That, however is not, for me, straight freedom of contract. Freedom of contract almost implies that you, you, you sit down with a blank piece of paper and, and um, come up with whatever agreement you, that suits you in the place. 
I think there needs to be safeguards within that for the tenants, for the landlords, that, that gives you a structured framework that you're working to, but allows the flexibility within that. And that would free up the market, would send a very clear message out to landowners, to potential landowners, to small farmers who may be thinking about retiring, getting out, that actually here's, a, here's a, an attractive option to find another way for the farm to be, to be productively used. Um, Mike Gascoigne. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to start by saying I hesitate to say this. I'm not going to hesitate to say this. This sector of the law is hugely overmanaged. There is enormous complications in the existing re legislation to do with crofting, with small holdings and agricultural holdings. And if, in this process, it could be made smaller, better, and less complicated for everyone concerned, I think the Law Society would wish that to happen. Um, ph philosophy is fine. Um, it would be interesting to have reality uh, kick in and see how we would simplify things. It's been suggested in crofting that uh, uh, the, the word simplify is easy, but the actual process is very, very time-consuming. Um, Law Commission, who could start again? I suppose there is, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, there are other parts of it I would like to see being taken forward. But first of all, before Christopher, um, uh, Graham wanted a wee point. Yeah, that, if back. I may go back to the point, Nigel Miller, it's part of a different work stream of this committee. We've been looking at the issue of rural housing. I want to go back to what you talked about, about creating small units. Uh, would it be useful if there was a presumed consent to build on the site of derelict properties, and we have many of those on our farmland around the country, not you wouldn't have a guaranteed uh, planning consent, but a consent to build, which would allow you, in principle, to have sites where you could construct houses uh, to allow you to do that. Would that be a useful thing to do? I think, uh, yeah, I, I think it would, and I think this, this comes up time and time again, that, that, that this is a barrier, and, and, uh, uh, and you know, different local authorities have different you know, sort of philosophies, and in some regions it's less of a barrier, but I think it is a genuine barrier, uh, and it's also uh, uh, you know, one of the reasons why you know, maybe you know, people are reluctant to retire, because they, they don't have a home to go to or, or, or to hand on, and they want to stay in their local community, and they want to you know, maybe stay near their... their, their you know, I suppose their spiritual home, almost having lived there all their lives. So I think that, that those sort of flexibilities, and, and you, you've, you know, that's a nice, smart, you know, solution really, or, or good fit. Yeah. Angus wanted to come back a bit, I think, and then uh, Claudia wanted to come in. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Uh, firstly, it was just to check if anyone else had uh, who hasn't spoken on on uh, freedom of contract, if anyone else had any views. Yes, yeah. Christopher. Um, we recognise that there is land that is that landlords are reluctant to let because of um, perceived fixed equipment obligations and provision of fixed equipment obligations for, for landlords. So we feel that um, there is room to um, lessen some of those obligations that may allow longer term letting. But the, the balance, as, as Nigel mentioned, is that in those situations the incoming tenant is going to have to provide the fixed equipment and we may need to make sure that his investments are protected at Wago at the other end of the, the tenancy. Um, we also have um, le lessons from, from England. England has now had FBTs for nearly 20 years, which are approaching freedom of contract. And we have an average, seeing an average length of term for FBTs in England of only around four years. Now, that's probably not the way forward for, for Scotland. Um, it's difficult to legislate for long-term tenancies and get people to use them. So really the only other tools available are, are fiscal measures to encourage long-term letting. Um, but we would, in the interest of Scottish agriculture, these new tenancies that are coming on the market, a fair proportion of them need to be long-term to allow um, the necessary investment and, and security for tenants. <coughs> Yeah, um, if I may convene, can I move on to small land holdings? Okay, um, with regard to uh, small land holdings, we know that um, the, the review group is considering the position of small land, hold, hold, la, sorry, small land holders and the Small Land Holders Act. Um, we also know that the Land Reform Group uh, recommended that uh, small land holders should have the, the, the right to buy. However, we know that uh, currently small land owners can only exercise the right to buy 
if they're within the areas where crofting uh, tenure was extended uh, in 2010 uh, and then convert their land holding into a croft. Um, and uh, we're informed that the LRRG found that no small landholders have been successful in, in doing that to date. Um, so I, I would ask members to comment on, uh, I would ask uh, panel members to comment uh, on whether you consider the statutory small landholdings uh, have a part to play in future land tenure arrangements. Um, I, I think there are lessons and ideas within the small landholdings legisl small landholders legislation that may enable um, new starter units to be to be set up. Um, whether whether you use the act or take ideas from it um, rem remains to be seen. Um, you mentioned the difficulties some small landholders are experiencing under the Crofting Reform Act of 2010, which allows them to convert to crofting status to allow a, a crofting right to buy. Their problem is the, convert, the difficulties doing the conversion, and um, we support the, the Land Reform Review Group's recommendation that instead of going through the conversion process, they simply have a, a, a right to buy if they qualify for it. I think that's the 2006 7 Act that uh, led to that, by anyway, because I had a, an unfortunate part to play in that, but attempting to try and solve a particular problem. But as I said, it's less than simple when you get down to the bit. So, but the, the general tone of what you say is correct, yeah. And uh, who else has wanted to come in there? Nobody. Okay, yeah. Mark. About the. Um, freedom of contract as aspect. Now, I, don't, I don't have any experience of small land holdings, but freedom of contract, um, I think you know, Sava's view is that there should be as little intervention of the law as possible, so really supporting um, Mike Gascoigne's point. Um, but you know, the, the, uh, just to pick up on, on what Christopher said about the average term of, of um, FBT south of the border, the, I just wanted to clarify that for whole farms, the, the average term is 10 years, which is probably more reflective of what we're trying to achieve. Okay. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Yeah. Good morning to you all. Um, I've listened with care to the um, information and evidence that you've given us about the, the whole issue of the different types of um, tenancies and arrangements for the sharing of land in Scotland that um, uh, my colleague Angus Robertson has, has led on. And I'm interested that, on the one hand, um, Mike, Mike, you're highlighting... Um, your, perceive the, your perception of the need for simplification with crofting law, which um, as a layperson I would certainly um, have some strong accord with. <laughs> uh, but, but also that, um, David Johnson, you're highlighting, um, I think, I, I hope I don't uh, misquote you when you say that in terms of LDTs that um, there should be safeguards and possibly a structured framework. So I'm just wondering the degree to which people on the panel see um, with the lap to help the land reform, sorry, not the land reform review group, the um, tenancy review group, apologies, going forward, um, what sorts of regulation or um, protections for both sides should they possibly be looking at that they maybe aren't yet in, in these different forms of um, arrangements for the sharing of land? Chris, Chris, Chris has touched on, it, it was actually, um, it, I was saying LDTs are, are, are a good vehicle, but within freedom of contract, if you're going to bring in freedom of contract, there still has to be safeguards within that. Uh, Chris has touched on one, um, one element of that, which is tenants do improvements within that. There has to be a mechanism within there to compensate for the, um, the improvements that have been done. The other thing which we haven't really touched on yet uh, is um, arbitration, some form of simple dispute resolution that um, all parties can go to without incurring the huge costs now which we're seeing when, when, when parties end up in the land court. That is um, resulting in people being afraid to go to land court because of the fear of the costs involved within it. Uh, and so you can end up with pressure on both sides to come to a result that isn't um, fairly or equitably done. So within any changes, I think Sava put forward a model for a simple arbitration uh, which could handle rent reviews, it could handle um, diversification, stuff like that. You'd still need the land court to um, legislate in points of law. But if we could find a simple 
way of doing binding arbitration. I think it would go a long, long way to sorting out a lot of the, lot of the, address, a lot of the problems we're seeing. So that has to be in there within the new vehicle. Uh, another question? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. that's, if that's, that's so, it. could you want to move on to your next question? Sorry, I mean, I'm not sure if somebody else wanted to. Martin, yeah. Yeah. I add a little to, to what David has just said in that Salva are also developing an independent expert approach as well, so really an extension of our arbitration procedures at the moment. We are certainly you know, very supportive of both, and I think your know, expert determination may well be you know, the, the preferred choice of, of many tenants. I think the, 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 the whole flaw is that uh, in, in many cases, the fallback of, uh, uh, of arbitration is you go to the land court. So you've always got that in the background. And I think we need to have some sort of barrier which you know, keeps people out of the land court, frankly. If there's always that overhanging the arbitration process, then it's, it's not going to be taken up or, or have the power that it should have. So I think that, 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 and that that's probably a, you know, a legal issue. I think the other thing which you know, I think came back from Sava is that arbitration at the moment is very much confined to summation of rent. In reality, we see arbitration being useful in points of uh, uh, you know, at Wago and possibly you know, look, you know, sorting out your know, differences in, in, in uh, view about uh, diversification and things like that. Uh, so we need to have you know, a, a, a arbitration opened up in, in a wider way. Thank you. And uh, Andrew and then uh, Mike. Um, convener, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry I've been in practice long enough to remember when arbitration was the preferred route uh, before the land court and um, the difficulty with arbitrations then was that you know they were often dealing with wider more complex issues rather than a single issue and the result was that people tended to turn up armed with a battery of lawyers. Um, I'm not sure if that's the right phrase, but anyway, they, um, they, 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 uh, they, they, they did come heavily represented, and the issues then uh, tended to be that the, the whole costs of the exercise spiraled. And, and the, the panacea to that was actually to move to the simplified system of the land court. Um, and w it clearly hasn't worked um, because um, these things, when they get to dispute, tend not to be about a single issue. They tend to be about a myriad of issues that get dragged in, and therefore um, the, the, the length of the dispute and the costs that go with that tend to um, uh, get out of hand, as we've recently seen. Um, I think that Sava should be commended in terms of the, 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 the concept that there, there should be, you know, going back to the, the grassroots of, of dispute resolution where there is a, an ability to have a, a simplified but clearly single issue arbitration to avoid it, it, it getting out of control. Um, and, and it may be that, you know, between a landlord and tenant, and it is often the case if, if, if there is a dispute that arises, it's, it's maybe not the rent that is the big issue. It could be some historical issue about something else. Therefore, there has to be an ability to actually prize those apart. And if there are going to be other issues, then they have to be treated individually. And therefore, hopefully, that would stop the thing um, getting out of control as it has and the costs that go with it. Uh, and Mike Gascoigne. Yes, uh, I, I think everyone here today would probably agree that the move to the land court in 2003 hasn't proved to be the right job. Um, it should probably, in most people's summation, be the last port of call when all that is at stake is the law and what the law says. Everything else should be kept as far away from the land court as possible. And a, and a system which allows for um, local, um, uh, uh, low cost um, operations to sort out disagreements uh, should be the target. But as final courts of appeal uh, now reach in the direction of the Supreme Court in Europe, um, how does the human rights element of uh, making an arbitration and then having an appeal, does it not just leave things as they are? If the appeal uh, is taken to the land court, it can then be taken on from the land court. The um, Arbitration Act of 2010, I think, gives you the answer there. It allows if it were extended to agricultural yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Christopher Nicholson. Um, the dispute resolution needs to be uh, um, 
in the main sorted out by by um, practical valuers, people, farmer arbiters with, with practical valuation experience. And most of today's disputes are really matters that should be resolved by um, practical arbiter valuers rather than allowing a dispute to become a, an arms race in legal gamesmanship, which it often happens. And I, I think that's mu as much a reflection on the... Our legislation is based on a a 1949 drafting when agriculture and tenancies were in a very different place than we are, we are today. And it, the, if, if the law was made more applicable and fit for modern purposes and clearer that we wouldn't have the, the legal gamesmanship involved. Okay, I think that's pretty uh, clear now. Um, Claudia, I want to come on to the next <coughs> question. Yeah, thank you, convener. Uh, there's, there's been many... Um, interesting suggestions uh, this morning. I wonder if I could uh, broaden things out on behalf of the committee just at the moment and ask for any comments about ensuring a supportive, wider cross-cutting context for the workings of um, the sharing of land in Scotland. We've had, um, as I say, a lot of suggestions this morning, but um, to be real about this, in the... Um, in the review itself, and I quote from page 52, it says that a theme running through the report is the often poor relationship between landlords and tenants, which is mired in expectations and behaviours derived from centuries of cultural history. Now, um, perhaps this morning doesn't um, sort of indicate that kind of an atmosphere at all, which is certainly positive, but... Um, Beyond the suggestions that have been made today, are there things that uh, the panel feel that they or think that they can put forward for consideration of the committee and indeed the, uh, the review group, which would help in what Martin Hall called the mutual respect, which of course exists in many, many circumstances um, between tenants and landlords? Um, we've... Uh, heard about mediation or arbitration, we've heard from, um, and, and those are sort of the legal aspects. I'm also very interested in um, if there are further issues within CAP reform um, beyond, um, in SRDP, I think Nigel Miller mentioned the possible second stage um, for, for um, after new entrants find they, they may be blocked. Um, We've also heard about assignation in quite a positive way and then some of the dangers about it. But I'm just wondering if there are other areas that really should be being considered to look forward for a vibrant, um, tenanted sector in Scotland. Nigel. I think on the relationship side, you know, it's the, the, the things have you know, been dropped in in, in you know, all, all sorts of different discussions. But I, I suspect that uh, uh, you know, you know, knowing who owns land... And, and who your landowner is, whether it be whoever it is, and having some sort of designated point of contact and some sort of continuity seems to me absolutely vital. And I think that you know, came a wee bit out of the land reform debate that you know, at times that doesn't seem to be totally apparent, frankly. Uh, and uh, it also means that if you are bringing in outside ex professional expertise, there is a point of contact who should be there during that negotiation as well. Uh, and I think that it may well be that, the, that uh, you know, if there is a, an office for tenancy or an adjudicator, that advice and support is available through that office. Uh, and if necessary, if, if somebody feels that they uh, uh, need some support, then they can go there. So there is some balance of, of uh, 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 expertise and, and, and available support. And there's also you know, a, a long-term uh, point of contact. Uh, I think you're know, making the practitioner's guide or the best practices, you know, almost mandatory, or to me, mandatory makes sense. Uh, my own view is that possibly some sort of assurance scheme for behaviours as far as uh, your professionals go makes sense. The reality is we have that in other sectors, uh, and this is a particularly crucial one, so why not here as well? And I think that would also answer some of the land use issues and the, the, the long, the short termism that we have and, and things like that. So, you know, you know, let's look at that. Uh, uh, um, you know, the, the, uh, the other sort of uh, areas that I think are important is really what we've just touched on, is having that sort of uh, uh, immediate access to dispute resolution, which is, you know, low cost, or you know what the cost is before you go into it, uh, and that it's fast. Uh, so, you know, you know that, that sort of package to me, you know, starts to give us a sector that uh, looks a bit more sensible than where we are now. 
uh, and uh, as far as the SRDP goes, yeah, just to underline where we are in that, I mean, obviously nothing's solid till it comes back from Europe, but there is a really good package there which you know, might go to 70,000 for a new entrant and you get a good business plan and you can actually fuel that business plan. You might even be able to buy stock. You can develop a business. Fantastic. But it may well be that it's limited to the first year or two that you're a new entrant. Well, once that's gone, you've lost it. Now, that probably is too short for a start because many new entrants from the last year or two haven't got the capital to, or, the, or the, the, the confidence to actually have that business plan. So maybe they need a bit of wiggle room. But certainly you should be looking at the second and third stages. Should a similar package be available? Because that, that's the time when you're going to have to jack up from being a part-timer with a job to a full-timer and possibly with a family. So you, you need that. So, so, so that's something that could be looked at. Christopher Nicholson. Um, I, I think key to improving relationships and taking the heat out of some of the disputes is, is a future role for um, a tenancy commissioner or a tenancy adjudicator who, before a dispute uh, escalates to the level of employing QCs, the parties can sit around a table with a, an adjudicator and almost mediate to see where everyone's positions are and try and narrow differences and put the, get the facts on the table. Um, at the moment, the, the, there is no forum or place to go to, to do that, and um, you immediately, if you can't resol resolve a dispute, you immediately end up in the situation of um, legal fees. How, how you would envisage those people being appointed, or what this forum might be, or is it well, but, something you can comment on? I, I think many stakeholders have. Um, recommended some form of tenancy commission or adjudicator yeah. um, also from an output <coughs> outcome from the land reform review group recommendations about a, a, a lands commission mm. um, it's important that you that that you find people who are impartial um, maybe it's a, a role for for professionals who are, who are retired from the press from their profession and have no commercial allegiance to one particular side or a mixture of individuals and when, when we were the three stakeholders here organizations were setting up the um, joint initiative on rent determination for the to cover the interim period we were, we were very aware that we had to create a panel that people would feel able to come to so um, r rather than staff staff it with um, professionals we, we've said that it should be a st uh, an office bearer from each of the organizations to make it look as though it's more approachable, have a simple application form to submit a, submit a complaint and have simple parameters that would allow you to submit a, a claim. Uh, David Johnson. I mean, to follow on from Nigel and, and, and Chris, it's um, when the review is completed, um, we will be settling down. And the ombudsman, the adjudicator, is going to be vital to ensuring that um, communication stays uh, current and pertinent to what's going on and we keep on airing any problems that are having quickly rather than letting them uh, develop to a point where they require more, more uh, action. So it's really for us, it's a form of um, self-regulation, self-policing to make sure that um, we never get back to the, uh, the distrust that's existed at the present. Uh, and we can build better relationships going forward into the future. So it's the, it's quite, it's the tone and the way we conduct ourselves with mutual respect for all parties to try and understand exactly what their, their desires are and address, address their concerns. In our debate on this point arising out of the interim um, report, um, we looked quite carefully at the possibility that something um, not dissimilar to the private rented housing panel could be a model if, whichever way the debate goes, a model is needed. But it works very well. It's cheap, it's successful, it's, it's, it's respected. Fine. Uh, Nigel, yeah? Sorry, I think... I think we certainly you know, looked at the panel a bit when we, we, we were in the last few days when we were looking at this sort of uh, uh, you know, group or, or, or review group, and I think you know, that it is a model that's definitely worth looking at. I, I guess that there probably should be two tiers in any sort of system. You, you, you probably need you know, that, that face of, uh, 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 you know, that goes direct to uh, you know, the tenant or the landowner and is there, you know, not, you know, hopefully holds 
you know, information in a data bank which is useful. They might even hold a data bank which is, uh, 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 you know, of, of potential young entrants to, to uh, you know, allow them support and access to, to landowners. And they also hopefully, you know, uh, hold codes of practice which cover all uh, points of operation, and then they interface with people and they conciliate and whatever. And uh, you maybe need a professional adjudicator when things go wrong. Uh, I think it needs to be backed up by an expert panel. The reality is we're in a dynamic world. New issues arise, uh, and you, you, that 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 uh, uh, I suppose face of the the panel or the adjudicator, you know, I think has to be detached from legal systems and has to be probably have quite a, a connection to the industry and, and support the industry. But you need some sort of legal expertise behind that, and, and you know, uh, uh, your know, RICS as well. You know, if there are particular issues, to refer to them to actually get their advice, to actually update codes or, or make make uh, submissions to the government. But there, there's a tool for the for the adjudicator group and the support group to use when new problems arise. So you, you need two tiers. Hopefully, it's low cost, uh, and it's something obviously the government would be very keen to put money into. I'm sure. But if it's not, then we should be keen to put money into. Frankly, it's something we need. You know. Okay, but it would be even better if we'd subsidy convergence earlier to help all these uh, entrant, new entrant farmers and so on, but that's another argument for another day that we've already had. Um, that all right for you, Claudia? Just now? Fine. Okay, thank you. I think everybody's had their say on that. Uh, Cara Hilton, um, point and... Yeah, uh, thank you, convener. Um, just by way of rounding things up, um, I'd be interested to hear the panel's views on behalf of the committee and the sort of... Um, the way the process has gone to date and how it's going to go going forward. Um, is there anything, any further evidence that needs to be considered before the final report is published or any sort of improvements that could be made generally? Okay. Yes, Christopher. Um, the, the, the answer is, is, is not, not really. We're very supportive of the way the, the review group have carried out the process and they've been very thorough in taking evidence. Um, my understanding of the way forward now is to, is to draft um, recommendations and then um, go around the countryside again having meetings, trying to um, um, uh, d draw criticism or approval to those recommendations. And I, 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 I can't think of a, a better way of doing it. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, Nigel? I think, you know, that last point that Claudia brought, brought up, really about you know, an adjudicator and office of support, you know, we all have a, 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 you know, a sort of vision of this wonderful body, but I think that none of us have actually, you know, or we certainly the union, haven't drilled it down enough to, to the actual mechanics about how you'd structure it and how you'd finance it. I think that you know, uh, I'm sure the review group will have views about that, but I think you know, it would be helpful if we were a bit more specific about you know, what this should do and how it should be structured. And I think that that's a challenge for us that we, we need to go back to the review group with. And I think the assignation question, it's, it seems to have come up you know, several times. Uh, and I think that we, we need to kind of try and see, you know, we can see the, 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 the real positives out of it, but there are some, some compromises that are there as well. We've got to get some sort of balance to that. I think those are the two that are, are most difficult. And I think diversification as well. That's another thing maybe we haven't touched on today, but I think that you're know, having a, a route through disputes where your know, uh, landowner isn't keen on a diversification is quite important. Limiting the process when there is dispute so it's not totally solved, and I think we've said that, but you need some sort of dispute resolution there. Otherwise, we're, 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 many farmers are going to be denied the opportunity to have a viable business. We, uh, I mean, the, from the process so far, we've been very supportive of. We think it's been conducted in, a, in, a, in a, an exemplary fashion. Uh, we found it to be engaging and, and inclusive. Uh, so we see that going forward into the future. We see the, um, the panel themselves, the, the review panel, drilling down into the, to the key issues that they're wanting to highlight now and then coming back to us on an ongoing dialogue basis to explore the ideas, to see where they go, uh, and then to help shape um, the the way it's going to form over the next four to five months. Um, they have, uh, in a sense, almost led us in our thoughts. I think they brought the industry closer together. They've been a, a step on from TFF, and it's almost done the role that TFF never quite managed to do. So um, we are very supportive and quite optimistic that what the outcome will be will be uh, productive for a, for a more vibrant tentative sector in Scotland. Thank you very much. Um, I think that probably kind of uh, is a good place to, uh, to end this particular session. Certainly the atmosphere um, is one of uh, helpful and uh, engaged 
activity which um, it makes a change from some of our past discussions which have seemed like trench warfare. Uh, and uh, we really believe that that is a, a very good omen indeed. And uh, I'd like to thank the panel for all their contributions just now. I've no doubt we'll be seeing you at some point when uh, we have uh, not just had the evidence but had the report later in the, uh, at Christmas. They say, what, well, let's hope the present that we get at Christmas is one that's going to be welcomed uh, for, as they say, it's not just for Christmas, it's for life. Uh, if we can make a long term, uh, you know, breakthrough here. That would be very good for uh, the whole of the agricultural sector in Scotland, and we'd be very much welcoming uh, bringing that about. So thank you very much for that. As we've agreed earlier, we're going to uh, end the public session. Now we're going to go into private. At next week's meeting, the committee will take evidence from stakeholders on the government's designation of marine protected areas. And we'll now clear the gallery and we will move the meeting into private.